السلام عليكم جود مورنينج ايفري بادي اي ويش يو فيري نايس داي اهلا اهلا بكم جميعا وي ار هابي تو بي ويذ يو توداي فيرست ساينتفيك داي فور ريد مي وي هاف بريفيسلي ميني ويبينارز ميني ليكتشرز اند فري اكتيفيتيز بات ذيس داي وي ميك ات لايك ذا فيرست Uh, scientific uh, activity uh, focusing uh, to be in the Middle East and focusing to be also uh, for uh, the curriculum of uh, Royal College uh, exams, FRCR, um, but also to, uh, to be careful to have all the aspects uh, regarding the subspeciality. So uh, this is combination between the Royal College exams uh, curriculum plus the uh, will be the uh, subspeciality uh, training. Uh, hopefully we uh, it will be the first scientific day and it will be repeated uh, along uh, the year and we uh, will be uh, happy for all participants to be together all over the uh, training sessions uh, all over the scientific days, uh, the next scientific days, inshallah. Um, today we have uh, many uh, amazing uh, lectures by uh, amazing uh, contributors. Uh, first of all, we uh, have uh, today Head and Neck, uh, then followed by Ultrasound, then we'll take a break. Then after the, the second session, we'll start with GIT. Uh, then we, uh, uh, after that, we have the pediatric. Then we'll take a break, uh, as you see in the uh, schedule now. And finally, we uh, uh, will end with the chest, then uh, neuro. Uh, all, all our contributors today, uh, they are uh, FRCR certified and uh, They will be uh, uh, focusing, as I told you, uh, regarding the uh, FRCR curriculum, plus they have the subspeciality um, training that they will give you as a nice experience. Uh, so, so you will take it in, in, a, in a good way and in, uh, in a way that they will try to make it very simple for you. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy uh, our day um, and the charlotte will be repeated. مرحبا بكم جميعا ونتمنى لكم الاستمتاع باليوم العلمي. Today our first uh, lecturer will, will be Dr. Rihem Al Hussein. Dr. Rihem, one of the uh, best uh, lecturers. Uh, she has been nice experience uh, through the head and neck. Uh, she uh, she is from uh, Alexandria University, Alexandria, and she is, by the way, the uh, one of the amazing staff there. And uh, she is have been a long time uh, giving uh, lectures, and inshallah, you will enjoy her first uh, session. I hope that uh, everything is going well. Um, let's start with Dr. Iham. Ready, Dr. Iham? Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first thing, I'm happy for uh, finally launching this scientific day, and it would be of great benefit for all our uh, junior colleagues, um, as well as colleagues in, in every uh, aspect uh, 
relating to clinicians as well and colleagues preparing for the FR. Uh, today I will start it so light. Uh, is not much familial uh, for you, uh, so I will take it that light. Uh, we have in the head and neck things that we need to look for first thing first. Whenever uh, my eye stands for a case on head and neck, I have a clue in this case that we usually dismiss. Uh, and this clue is usually the nodes. The lymph nodes can tell me a lot about the pathologies in the head and neck. That even the patient can come without admitting that he is suffering from any loss of sensation, any abnormality with the prey or any abnormality with the uh, swallowing. Sometimes the patient don't feel it. They just feel it as a bulbable lymph node. What can I do and what I'm supposed to, to say and how can I tell this lymph node is suspicious or not and how can I differentiate it from other cystic legion? That's what we are going to see. So don't forget that the lymph nodes in the head and neck is usually a current stations where every tumor or every inflammation or infection and sometimes granulomatous infection do uh, stop at these stations. So we have stations, it, any uh, pathology have to stop at certain station, then go to the other station. They can't skip their own station to other areas without passing by the main stations. They are uh, regular, okay? Um, how can I tell that uh, there is a suspicious lymph node from its size? It could be, but this is not the most I the ideal way to tell that there is a pathology in a lymph node. This is not the ideal. Maybe it would be an ideal but uh, way of uh, describing of the lymph nodes in the GIT or the chest. But in the head and neck, the the size wise is not the ideal way to describe a lymph node or to suspect that is uh, there is pathology over here in this area. But it can help us or give a push in the diagnosis that would support the idea that there is a pathology over here. Uh, for the size, we don't measure the long axis of the, of the lymph node. We measure the short axis of the lymph node. Uh, and when you measure the short axis of the lymph node, uh, just uh, recognize that uh, the size of the lymph node has to be greater than 10 millimeter, mostly greater than 10 meter, except for main two stations of lymph nodes, which is level two and retropharyngeal, and we will see them uh, just in the next slides. Uh, so the first thing is the size. Okay, it's not a. It just shares in the diagnosis by only twenty five percent, perhaps, and it is regularly greater than ten millimeter. Uh, these are the size of the lymph nodes, uh, but also sometimes smaller lymph nodes that are less than seven millimeter could be involved with the pathology. But it's well and good if it was missed in the report. Okay, it's fine if we missed it in the report because it is too tiny to characterize. Why not? Okay, it is accepted, and also the surgeons knew about this very well. So yes, according to the size, it's. It is likely when it when the lymph node is greater than 10 millimeter, it gives us a clue about a pathology that is going over there. Uh, but sometimes smaller lymph nodes could be involved and could be metabolically active on other sequences and on the pathology appears to be pathological lymph nodes. Um, uh, this could happen, yes, uh, and if we missed it, this is not uh, our fault and this is not our failure. It is acceptable. So uh, this is according to the size. Is there any other thing that can tell me uh, that there is a pathology going over there in the head and neck? Yes, uh, not only the size, the presence of tiny areas of hypo densities inside the lymph nodes, these areas especially involving the cortex, because the normal appearance of a lymph node could be enhancing cortex with a central hilum. This is accepted. But the, the feature that is not accepted, that the area of regular enhancement of the cortex shows a foci of hypodensities within. Whenever this uh, appearance is present in a lymph node, whatever its size, it is uh, likely uh, to be infiltrated by a certain pathology and likely this certain pathology to be tumor. So this is um, a well um, presenting criteria for a suspicious lymph node. Another thing that that picks my eyes also is the the crowding of lymph nodes in one place uh, rather than the other. We, we, in the head and neck, usually you have to compare the right side by the left side. Uh, you can't 
diagnose without comparing the right with the left side. So if you find the lymph nodes are likely to be clumped or uh, aggregated in certain area, uh, you can see here on the left side, there is no lymph nodes. And on the right side, there is many lymph nodes here and there. Uh, this gives me a clue that there is a pathology over there at the right side. So this is also an important checklist. Whenever you are introduced to a case of head and neck, just uh, uh, identify if there is crowding of the lymph nodes at certain site rather than the others or not, even if they look not suspicious, even if they look too small. The third thing is the extra nodal extensions, which is likely on imaging to be the definite uh, sign of uh, a pathology uh, or tumoral infection in cases of the head and neck. Um, this uh, nodal involvement um, could be, uh, how can I tell that there is an extra nodal extension? You will find an indefinition of one of the margins of the lymph node. You will find there is an irregular margins of the lymph node. They are not well defined, they are irregular. Uh, here, you, you can't pick up the lateral cortex of the lymph node, and also there's, there are areas of hypo densities within. You can change the window. It's it's up to you. You have you have to change the window until you pick up that there is something wrong inside. There is internal hypodensities. Yes, you can change the window to find it, and uh, till you identify uh, the the irregularities and the, there is shappy appearance at the margins. And mostly, when there is an extra nodal extension, you will find the node uh, com connected with no uh, fat blends between it and the related muscle between it and the related structure. This doesn't tell that this is a mass. This is a lymph node because this is the site of the lymph node. So whenever we are tackling the sites or areas of lymph node and there is a pathology that looks ugly, it is primarily a lymph node. First thing first, okay? So don't uh, jump to any other differential diagnosis when you are in areas of lymph nodes. It's like level one and level two, level three, level four, any levels of those that are occupied by the lymph node. And I can see an ugly enhancing mass. It is primarily a lymph node, okay? That is, that is sentinel for another pathology that I have to look for uh, afterwards. So the first thing is the presence of, um, here also there is extra nodal uh, infiltration to the related areas. The fat in this area is lost, totally lost, being infiltrated by the extra nodal extensions of the lymph node. Uh, that's how I can tell that there is a pathology in the area of the lymph node. So uh, whenever I pick an, uh, a lesion in, uh, in any region occupied by lymphatics, I have first to put my first differential as nodal mass. Uh, nodal masses in cases of pediatric is usually to be infectious. Uh, and in adults are usually also to be uh, granuloma, granulomatosis in the form of sarcoid, tuberculous, or lymphomatous lesions, or sentinel for and head and neck masses. Uh, in pediatric, it's not that common to find a head and neck masses, but it it would be usually a landmark for a certain inflammation regarding the submandibular gland, or it could be um, a, a sign for uh, uh, infectious disease uh, in the head and neck rather than being a, a tumorous lesion or sarcoidosis or granulomatous lesion. So just identifying the age of the child or the age of the patient is very important to tell why the there is a pathology in the lymph node that we are presented with. Um, okay, so what the stations can tell me, what, what What's what is it, what it could be used for? It could be used for that we can identify. We have first to make a map for our lymph nodes. Uh, identifying the lymph nodes simply can be. Uh, you would find that there is a submandibular gland. This is the submandibular gland. Uh, just below the mandible, at the level of the mandible, there is the submandibular gland. Just beneath it. From the, from the posterior aspect of the submandibular gland, everything anterior at this region is considered to be level one lymph node. Everything posterior to this area is considered to be level two lymph node. Uh, and there is another line 
uh, that can separate this region from the most posterior, which is the sternocleidomastoid. So we have two S to uh, ident to make a map for the head and neck. Here, the first line is posterior to the submandibular gland, and the other line is posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. One to differentiate the one B from the two uh, A, and the other is to differentiate the two from the five. Uh, lymphatic drainage influence. Uh, so that's how we can identify the leveling. All of these separations is being present in the suprahyoid space. What's the appearance of the hyoid bone? The normal appearance of the hyoid bone is this triple, appear uh, triple appearance or the three separated cartilages from each other. It, they are two cartilages and it would separate the third one in the middle. This is called the hyoid bone. So anything or any lymph node just anterior to the posterior margin of the sternomastoid and above the, this level of this bone, up till this point, me, I mean by above the level of the hyoid, that until this bone is totally vanished from the image till the, le to the, till the lower aspect of this bone. So anything anterior to uh, to it, it will be level one. Anything posterior to it, it would be level two. Uh, in in level one, uh, it could be also again separated into one A and one B by meaning of the this muscle that is called the anterior belly of digastric muscle. Uh, things that are medial to it is one A, and things that are lateral to it is one B. But overall, if you just said one, okay, it's fine. This is one. So, Previously, it has been named as submental group and submandibular group, but it's fine. They are level one once you are anterior to the submandibular gland and above the hyoid bone. Again, being anterior to the submandibular gland uh, makes uh, gives us the clue that we are at level one. Uh, level two, which is the commonly affected uh, lymph nodes in all uh, of the head and neck cancers, and we will see some cases right now. Um, level two is just behind the, the submandibular gland and anterior to the posterior edge of the sternomastoid. So when, when this is the sternomastoid, it ends here, then all this region is going to be two. And posterior to the sternomastoid, as we described before, would be level five. Uh, again, this is level two because we this is not the submandibular gland. Don't miss with it. This this is a residual portion of the submandibular gland, by the way. This is the level of the submandibular gland. We are posterior to it and still uh, related to the sternocleidomastoid and not uh, posterior to it. Uh, this lymph node is... Uh, compressing over the internal jugular uh, vein. Um, and once the lymph node is compressing over the internal jugular vein and there is no fed planes between the uh, lymph node and the internal jugular vein, it is called the 2A. If there is a fat plan between it and the internal jugular vein, then it could it is named as 2B uh, uh, lymph node. Again, as you can see, there is internal hypodensities within it. The axis is likely to be enlarged more than 10 millimeter, one centimeter. Uh, but still, there is no extra nodal extensions. On the right side, you can suspect that there is an extra nodal extension here. There is not the, the fat is not that clear, and there is areas of hypodensities, and this area or margin couldn't be well identified. So you have to suspect that there is an extra nodal extensions. Again, in the level two, it is posterior to the submandibular gland. If it lies on the related vessel, especially the internal jugular, then it is 2A. If it is away from it by a clear fat, then it is a level 2B, but still in front of the posterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid. Uh, down from the hyoid bone uh, till the level of the cricoid, as we said, the, the, the appearance of the three shapes, this three shapes is the hyoid bone. And here we will start the, uh, the, the larynx downwards uh, from the level of the hyoid up till the level of the cricoid bone. The cricoid bone is... Uh, we, we identified by the horse show that is being present posterior here. And, and at this level, you will find the trachea well-developed and circular in shape. This is the cricoid. Um, so from the level of the hyoid till the level of the cricoid, then we, we will consider this as level 
three lymph nodes. What's the big deal if I identified a level three uh, lymph node? It's, again, the level three lymph node should be posterior to the sternal, uh, uh, the submandibular gland and anterior to the posterior margin of the sternomastoid. Then this is considered to be level three. Okay. Uh, what if I identified such allegiance? These are clues for many pathologies. What could be the pathology? Just right here, you can see that there is an odon mass, and this patient came without any complaint at all. He wasn't complaining except for that swelling at the lateral neck mass. The first presentation was a lateral neck mass. Uh, and on examination by ultrasound, they were suspicious lymph nodes, and they were taken, obtained biopsy from it. And uh, then on retrograde assessment uh, by the CT scan, uh, this was uh, uh, an uh, involved lymph node, and this area is irregular with infiltrated fat planes related to it. Again, this uh, is posterior to the sternomastoid muscle and anterior to the posterior aspect, uh, sorry, the, the, it is posterior to the submandibular gland and anterior to the posterior aspect of the sternomastoid between the two S's. Then this is level two because we are at the area of the mandible. Then we are in level two and it is compressing the vascular structure. Then this is 2A. Uh, so this was one of the lymph nodes. For uh, further lower cuts at the level of the hyoid, you can see that, that there are multiple uh, enlarged, pathologically enlarged lymph nodes. How can I tell they are pathological? Areas of internal breakdown, irregular outlines with involved fat related to it, denoting an extra nodal extension, multiple other involved lesions, as we can see. In this case, if I give, give him a differential of an abscess, this would be a big fail. I can't give a, a differential for an abscess in such cases of uh, in such uh, aggressive appearance of involved uh, lymph nodes. So I have to find my primary. My primary uh, for the involvement of level two uh, in the head and neck is likely to be a supraglottis, uh, hypopharynx, or oral cavity. Uh, how can I tell it is likely or it is more likely to be an oral cavity if I found that uh, plus the level two is level one also being involved? If also level one is being involved, as we can see here, this is one, one P, because this is lateral to the anterior belly of the digastric, then it is likely to be an oral cavity. So double check for the oral cavity. And after double checking for the oral cavity, this was the tongue cancer here, so linear, but enhancing uh, mass lesion that is being present. Uh, for the lymph node, it is a station. I'm not expecting to find pathologically enlarged lymph nodes on the left side when I have the main uh, pathology on the right side. This is not routine uh, because it has to get to each station first, then go to the contralateral aspect. Involvement of the contralateral aspect means this is a very late stage in the disease with the very poor diagnosis in the case. So whenever I pick a pathology here, don't uh, uh, just say that it could be inflammatory because the fat blends is being involved. It could be tumor. Just knowing uh, these areas could drain uh, the oropharynx, meaning this area. The oropharynx is the area uh, at the level of the mandible uh, and the posterior aspect of the tongue with the tonsils. This is called the oropharynx. So it could be due to the oropharynx or high above, which is the oral cavity itself, uh, or it could be in the hypopharynx, this, this area posterior. It's one of them. So it is either the, the oropharynx, the hypopharynx, or the oral cavity itself. One of these three areas would metastasize to these lymph nodes. Uh, <clears throat> with likely the oral cavity involving the first uh, station or the level one lymph node is likely to be a, a tumor of the um, tongue. Uh, again, this is an oral uh, cavity tumor, and again the metastasizing lymph node. This is this is the submandibular gland. We anterior to the submandibular gland is level one. Posterior to the submandibular gland is level two. Again, the areas of fossae of hypodensities, and again it is resting over the jugular vein. It is uh, level two A. 
Also, the floor of the mouse can send some metastasis uh, to uh, to the relating uh, lymph nodes, and this is an area of uh, um, floor of the mouse involvement with tumor. Uh, and here you can see that there is uh, an ugly looking lymph node at the same site. Uh, also, the bat can tell so many. This is a, an area that could that that passed missed on uh, on CT. It was too tiny to find the lesion and too tiny to pick up the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes were too tiny, uh, less than ten millimeter. And on the bat uh, CT, these lymph nodes were evid uh, uptake metabolically active, uh, and this was a lesion to be recognized on the bat CT. Um, then uh, we can tell also uh, that we said also that the oropharynx can send. What, is, what do we mean by the word of the oropharynx? We mean by the retro uh, molar uh, space or the tonsils. These are the areas of the oropharynx likely to metastasize. Uh, and involvement of the areas of the oropharynx is... Uh, um, a moderate prognostic uh, criteria. Not, it's not good criteria, okay? Because this lesion seems to be so aggressive. Here we have, uh, here the tonsils, there is a mass lesion that is involving these tonsils. Again. Uh, just after a few months without any treatment, this patient back again with that huge mass uh, all through uh, the area of the uh, oropharynx, involving the through the area of the oropharynx, and here are the lymph nodes being involved. Again, the, the lymph node is totally uh, uh, showing internal uh, hypodensities within, and started to infl infiltrate even the oral cavity. So, missing cases of the head and neck uh, cancers is crucial uh, because they take no time to spread. Uh, other lesions that can involve same levels that we have told about the level two and three, which is the soft palate. Uh, also, the soft palate can send metastasis to the same uh, levels, two and three lymph nodes, and the retropharyngeal lymph node as well. We will see it later. Then also, this is the hypopharynx. As we said, that the area of the uh, hypopharynx can send us to, to other uh, lymph nodes. Again, there is here the uh, the posterior cricoid area. This is the area for the cricoid. We can see the trachea well and good. This is the area of the cricoid cartilage. We can see notably the cricoid because it has been smashed by, by the lesion and the lesion grew up to the level of the pyriform uh, apex with the involvement of the related lymph nodes. It has lymph nodes everywhere because it is in the midline and crossing the midline. Uh, what could it tell in this case? It tells that there is aggressive tumor because bilateral lymph nodes being involved because it is crossing the midline. Usually the, the lesions have to be on one side and metastasizing to its unilateral lymph nodes. If it is involving the midline, crossing the midline, involving multiple lymph nodes, it is likely to be more aggressive disease with a very poor prognosis in case in treatment. In the larynx, also the larynx sent to the same area, uh, but it is the supraglottic larynx, uh, not not at the level of the two vocal cords or the infraglottic area, not the glottic or, and the infraglottic areas. These don't don't uh, don't have lymphatic drainage. Uh, the lymphatic drainage is expected whenever there is a supraglottic larynx being involved. When there is a supraglottic larynx involved, also expected to find the metastasizing lymph node again to be level two or three lymph nodes. Uh, again, here there is er areas of internal uh, hypodensities, and this is the sentinel or the mass lesion, which have the same appearance of the lymph node. Whenever you have a tumor having the same appearance of the lymph node, this is diagnostic for a metastasis in the lymph node. Um, so this was the mass, uh, and incidentally, uh, for for that it was a very aggressive lesion. There was also on the contralateral side. This doesn't mean uh, um, it is regular. This is not regular. This upstages the uh, case. 
just like this. So whenever there is a legion, I'm expecting to find lymph node in at that area. Whenever there is another suspicious lymph node on the contralateral aspect, I'm upstaging the case and telling that there is a very, very poor prognosis in this case. Okay, so also, uh, so this was a case here. I, I'm I've just choose this case because the lymph node uh, that is being present here in this case is too tiny lymph node that small but there is a landmark in this lymph node because the criteria of size is not the best thing to tell there is here there is internal hypodensity even in that small little lymph node this means that there is um, a metastasis to this small little lymph nodes. So don't stop up till this. Whenever you suspect a small little lymph node to be infiltrated on the level of the CT, just image it with the ultrasound because the ultrasound can tell maybe much better. So don't stop up till this. Whenever you find that it is not fulfilling the whole criteria, but there is one of the landmarks to tell that this is a suspicious lesion, go further for uh, an ultrasound for this lymph node because it can tell much better for those smaller in size. Uh, what's the cause here is the supraglottic, this uh, aggressive supraglottic uh, lesion. Uh, because this is the level of the supraglottus. Okay, and downward you can see that there is, here is the false and the true vocal cords. Okay, um, then we have also uh, down from this level. So as you can see that most of the head and neck drain in level two and three, uh, with exception for the oral cavity that shows two, three, and one. Um, Otherwise, everything just sends to two and three. Uh, but what sends for four and five and six? That's what we are going to see right now. Uh, level four is it stands when you go down below the cricoid and above the level of the clavicle. Whenever you see the clavicle, you are in the supraclavicular group. Omit the idea of the level four. So from the level of the cricoid uh, down to the level of of the clavicle, we are talking about level four. It replaces two and three, means that it is a posterior, a, a, a lateral to the major vessels, being lateral to the major vessels like this, lateral to the major vessels, not medial to them. They are lateral to the major vessels and the anterior to the posterior margin of the sternomastoid, because what's being present behind the posterior aspect of the sternomastoid is level five. And this this huge triangle is level five. Okay, so the level five is very huge and it is any area behind the posterior aspect of the sternomastoid. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is level five. Again, this is the sternomastoid, as you can see here, drawing a red line from the posterior uh, margin of the sternomastoid is all of this is level five uh, till the level of the trapezius. This is the trapezius muscle. Anything between those two red lines is considered to be level five anterior to this sternomastoid and uh, later lateral to the uh, major vessels. Uh, uh, downwards is considered to be level uh, four. But between the internal major vessels or the internal, th these are the major vessels, anything in internal, if we draw a line here, oops, there's no drawing. Okay. If we draw a line here, anything inside this area would be considered level six, not four. Anything outside this area is considered level four. Again, to put it sharp, you will take a line related to the medial margin of the major vessels. You will draw this line, this line, anything internal to this area would be considered level six, except uh, at the skull base. Anything lateral to this area and anterior to the sternum, to the posterior aspect of the sternum would be considered as level four. That's when we are below the cricoid uh, uh, bone and above the clavicle.
Okay, what can involve this? Uh, what can involve this uh, area? So don't forget forget again uh, that between the carotids is the level six. Um, uh, again, to differentiate between them, then this level this is level four. Again, this is level four. We are not between. If we draw a line from the internal, from into from the jugular vein right here, okay, here. There is nothing here. Okay, then level six is free. What we have is this lymph nodes and this lymph node. This means that we are in level four, not level six. Uh, this is how can you differentiate between them. So what happened where uh, there is another image for level six? Okay, and this is level six currently. You can draw a line here. You can draw a line here. This is internal to it. These areas, this is internal to it. This is internal to the jugular vein. This is level six. Or the delphic lymph nodes, which is uh, present here anterior to the cricoid, superficial in the subcutaneous, uh, the delphic lymph nodes uh, also is considered to be level six. What's the big deal for the involvement of level four or level six? What's the big deal? The big deal is the main is the thyroid gland. Whenever there is a cystic mass related to level three, four, and six, it is likely from the thyroid because the thyroid has a papillary cancer which is, which likes the lymph nodes too much, and always presented with the calcified lymph nodes with internal breakdowns. As you can see here, there is a mass lesion related to the thyroid, and again, this is level four being involved. If you draw a line from the internal margin of the uh, vein, this area is the thyroid itself, and the lateral to it, there is a lymph node here that takes the same appearance of the main nodule of the thyroid. Uh, and this tells that there is a thyroid, uh, this is not a normal nodular goiter, this is a suspicious uh, lesion in the thyroid that had metastasized to the neck, a lymph node. Um, and there is a characteristic appearance for the babillary cancer, which would really metastasize in the thyroid lymph nodes. Uh, there is, um, special appearance on the T1 weighted uh, images on the MRI and this is characteristic to it that usually the presence of a hyper intense nodule on the thyroid and a hyper intense uh, node lymph node on a T1 non contrast image is uh, characteristic for the presence of a cancer thyroid papillary carcin thyroid that metastasize. So whenever you pick a lymph node that is hyper intense on the T1, usually lymph nodes on the T1 without contrast appears to be ISO or intermediate signal. But whenever you see a lymph node that is hyper intense related to the level three, level four, or level six, do suspect directly that there is a papillary thyroid, even if you can't pick up this papillary thyroid. What if I saw this legion, uh, I saw this lateral neck mass that is hyper intense on the T1, and I can see any lesions in the thyroid, ask for further ultrasound assessment, because the ultrasound can tell if there is a small nodule in the thyroid gland that we can miss on the MRI. Any very tiny lesions, small lesions, less than one, uh, less than uh, 0.5 millimeter could be missed on the MRI, and the ultrasound has an upper hand in it. So you can go and ask for further uh, ultrasound uh, when you see these suspicious, especially in level three, level four, and level six. Again, this is another case, and this is a uh, thyroid uh, cancer. People could think that this is a uh, uh, vascular malformation as much as it, it is too much uh, enhancing. But the presence of nodal stations, because these are lymph nodes, uh, this is the area of a lymph node. So being in the area of a lymph node and sharing the previously uh, mentioned appearance of the extranodal extensions and being coupled at certain side of the neck, leaving the left side normal. All of this tells that there is a tumor, not a vascular malformation or benign finding. Uh, again, this is uh, this is level, uh, if we talk, it, 
take the uh, the nodal stations. Currently, we are at level two because we are from the mandible and haven't reached the hyoid. Then from the hyoid downwards, you are going downwards. Here you are, uh, it, it, it lasts to level three. And then more downwards, with, after the cricoid and the downwards, it would be level four. As you can see here, this is level four. Um, and also the thyroid uh, mass had invaded the major vessel that is being present here with multiple collaterals being uh, developed. Um, this case uh, uh, was missed on ultrasound. It was it, it passed with a nodular goiter, normal nodular goiter, uh, and it presented on this CT uh, later on after uh, nine months. It took no time, and actually this was the legion in the ultrasound. Whenever you are exposed by an ultrasound for a thyroid gland, uh, if you find any abnormal uh, uh, echo pattern, uh, even if you can tell uh, this is a mass, it's not well defined, it is totally ill defined. Any hypoechoic pattern with areas of calcification within suspect a papillary carcinoma and ask for further uh, MRI and biopsy it. These are the how you deal with the cases. Direct, directly go for the biopsy from this area of ill definition or abnormal uh, echo pattern on ultrasound because missing the cases could uh, be presented very late with uh, metastatic uh, problems. And this is uh, another case for a buccal cavity uh, carcinoma. Uh, and as you can see here, there are multiple levels of involved lymph node being in the oral cavity itself. So we can see that there is level one being involved as well as level two uh, being involved. So we have level one and level two both being involved in cases of oral cavity tumors, once again for revising the case. Uh, then we have level seven, which is actually mediastinal, but okay, it was classified as level seven. This is uh, behind the sternum or the maneuvering of the sternum. Again, back to the head and neck, uh, um, the supraclavicular uh, region is, con whenever you see the clavicle, Whenever you see the clavicle, things behind it could be a supraclavicular uh, lymph nodes. And supraclavicular lymph nodes is not, are not a must for uh, head and neck. All previously mentioned lymph nodes are a must for a head and neck cancer, uh, except for uh, uh, the supraclavicular lymph nodes and the intraparotid lymph nodes. So the supraclavicular lymph node could be due to breast cancer. So ask about the breast. Um, it could be due to GIT cancers. So ask about the GIT cancers. And it could be also uh, as a part of a systemic disease in lymphomatous involvement and head and neck uh, tumors, but it is not really routinely uh, a head and neck uh, specific uh, station of nodal station. Uh, but we have on the other side uh, a near station for the head and neck, which is the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. The retropharyngeal lymph nodes is at the area of the longus coli, just below the, uh, the, the skull base, oh, yes, keep it till the level of uh, the dense bone, the level of the dense bone. Once the dense bone ends, there is no more retropharyngeal lymph nodes. From the dense up to the skull base, this is a retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And the retropharyngeal lymph nodes is sentinel for soft ballot uh, masses or nasopharyngeal uh, tumor. These are the only tumors that sense to it. So whenever you find a retropharyngeal lymph nodes, it is a clue. It is a gift in, in the case. And whenever you see a case, and this is a nasopharyngeal tumor, and this is the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Again, it is just anterior to the lingismus coli, early up, just below the skull base. It doesn't continue uh, below uh, uh, C2. Uh, we have also the intraparotid uh, lead, uh, lymph nodes. It, it could denote uh, MITS because it is involved notably in cases of lung cancer, lung cancer is presented with intraparotid lymph nodes and skin cancer, wherever the skin it is involved, it is presented by intraparotid lymph nodes. So again, it is a, a, an appreciable clue in the case. Not all the cases of the intraparotid lesion can be uh, intraparotid tumors in itself. They can be metastatic lymph nodes, especially if there is a history of tumor or the patient have any other um, uh, pathologies, he just... Uh, looking after. Um, 
So um, that's nearly um, most of uh, the discussion. Don't forget again that we have uh, the lymph node involvement could be diffuse, and in cases of diffuse involvement, it is lymphoma, leukemia, meaning by diffuse is contralateral, right and left. But if you have unilateral, uh, just to the right side, so suspect that there is a malignancy along the right side, as we said. If it is involving level one, it is oral cavity one, two, three, uh, or two, three. This is likely oropharynx, supraglottis, hypopharynx. If it involves the level four and six and three, it is likely a thyroid cancer. If it is intraparotid, could be skin, could be a uh, lung cancer. Uh, if it involves the retropharyngeal lymph node, then there's a soft palate or uh, nasopharynx. Um, that's uh, if you identified an abnormal lymph node that is unilateral. Uh, it could be diffuse and bilateral. Uh, it could be lymphoma, leukemia, sarcoid, tuberculosis. Uh, all of this involves uh, two aspects of the neck, not only one side. Uh, in cases of HIV or cat scratches disease, related disease, uh, inflammatory diseases, um, uh, could be also uh, focal, and for focal, uh, it could be tumor or infection. Sometimes the diffuse can involve, uh, could be a late stage of the tumor, but this is not the most common presentation. But sometimes, yes, uh, it could be a late stage or a late presentation for, uh, that, uh, for the tumor. And I will show you a last case for this. Um, um, and this is the AGCC criteria telling us that denoting the extra nodal extension, as we said, the area of irregularity with involvement of the related fab upstages uh, the nodal metastasis to level N3. And this criteria is very important whenever it is picked up, which is much, much more important than uh, being presented with um, um, uh, the control, uh, the size wise, uh, as we said uh, before. And uh, just for a last case. Okay. Okay, so if if anyone would like, I, I thought that it would be able for anyone to uh, to try to to scroll, but okay, I will show you the case anyway. Uh, this patient came just like this, and the appearance, as you can see right here, it is bilaterally involved with lymph nodes. This is level two. Okay, this is level two. There is the this is a retropharyngeal lymph node, as we said before. We are we are at the level of the C two, and going downwards. Again, this level three being involved, and also the contralateral aspect, even though. But there is an a terminal mass lesion involving the nasopharynx itself. So the bilaterality is mostly to be a, a, a inflammatory process or lymphomatous involvement, but it could also be a, a, a worse prognosis for a tumorous uh, lesion. So don't skip it in urine differential diagnosis. And it is likely whenever there is bilateral involvement in cases of tumor to find a mass and a marvelous mass. Uh, that uh, involves this area. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, just someone asked any questions? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Rehab. And uh, we appreciate very nice lecture, informative uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Any questions?